when we finished Spyro Year of the Dragon, that was when PlayStation, the first PlayStation, was entering the end of its life cycle. And we knew that we wanted to work on the PlayStation 2, so the question was, what kind of game are we going to do? Do we stick with Spyro? I felt like we couldn't go any further after um, Spyro Year of the Dragon. I felt like we kind of hit the, the limits. It's like, okay, this is like the best Spyro game. It's got all the bells and whistles. It's got tons of mini games, different playable characters. And I, I didn't really feel like we could go any further. So I'm glad that we moved into different territory. Spyro, you'll have to go. We wanted to start fresh. We wanted to come up with a new character, a new, uh, pretty much a new concept for a game. We also wanted to go really high tech as well, because Spyro was kind of a medieval world, and we were trying to go a little different so we could give it a different look. Starting with that blank page that first day was pretty scary, because, you know, how do you create a franchise, you know? And that's something that we all talked about, you know, how do we make this thing work? We all started brainstorming back in the winter of 1999-2000, uh, and we had an advanced team of a few people working on the PlayStation 2 technology. Yeah, we, we did struggle a bit with the technology at first. Using highly sophisticated technology, which you couldn't possibly understand. It was our first PlayStation 2 game. At that point, we still weren't quite sure what we were doing for the game. We had a lot of different ideas. We were thinking about adventure games, uh, more uh, adult-oriented games, uh, darker type uh, theming. We wanted something that we felt the players could really get into, was very uh, hands-on and a lot, of, a lot of stuff to blow up. Brian Hastings had said that he, he um, wanted to make a game about this alien that travels from planet to planet in a spaceship and gets to collect all these gadgets and weapons. I was kind of peripheral to the story. I, I had uh, some responsibilities, but it was pretty minor. And that was the kernel of the idea. And as soon as he said that, everybody started thinking about it and said, yeah, that's, that's kind of what we're looking for. When we made the decision to do Ratchet and Clank, we, uh, Jason Rubin, fortuitously, called me up and said, how would you guys like to take a look at the Jack and Daxter engine? Because they had developed this amazing background renderer for the PlayStation 2. And uh, we decided that, yeah, we, we would love to take a look at it. And at that point, we developed a a technology sharing agreement with Naughty Dog where they would let us uh, check out some of their code. We would take it, uh, modify it for our needs, and then give it back to them in the hopes that it would help them on their next game. And it was really an incredible opportunity and an incredible situation in this very competitive industry where no money changed hands. This is all about helping each other out and uh, it sounds corny, but kind of furthering the art of video games. We had some brainstorming sessions and everyone got to give input on what they wanted to see in a science fiction um, action platformer uh, first person type shooter game. Mm -hmm. We combine a lot of genres. One of the things that is going to be a problem with a platform based game that uses a lot of weapons is that that's never really been done before and it changes the entire uh, feel of the gameplay. I mean in the past the gameplay in a platform game was always run up to a guy and jump on top of his head. Now, if you can shoot them from halfway across the level, it, it really feels different. We had uh, Dave Gurton, our lead character designer. He spent the entire game pretty much uh, just designing character after character. He's got sketchbooks full of many, many... He's not a cat, he's not a dog, he's not a monkey. Here's a drawing that our animation director Oliver did, which that was, that was the direction that he was kind of following. At the same time that he was working on that, um, I, I was working on this kind of character, which is a bit more cat-like, uh, much smaller, and that's where we came up with this form, where we, we kept the you know the larger ears from the from the cat creature, um, kept the gloves, but then we retained some of the details like the straps and the pants. From there, we just kind of kept working and playing with the proportions until we arrived at the final ratchet, um, much taller, uh, very very. Uh, very action-oriented and ready to kick some ass. Oh, and by the way, the name's Ratchet. Pleased to make your acquaintance. Say, oops. I'll just call you Clank for short. As far as Clank goes, Clank went through a lot of iterations as well. Clank actually started out as being three separate robots that Ratchet wore. And that just wasn't working for us because it really stripped the personality away from 
from Clint because all these robots had to compete for the spotlight and it just wasn't going to work. So what happened was we took those three and we combined them into one robot. Ratchet, am I cool now? He was he was much smaller. He was he was kind of baby like. But then we also tried some some taller incarnations of him as well. Um, the big lower jaw because you know maybe maybe he had this kind of attitude. Um, and we just kind of continued on with that. We even went with really tall, but then we found that this form was competing a little bit too much with uh, Ratchet's form. And then finally we arrived at kind of this, this small baby-like creature uh, that we could transform into all these different packs so that when we saw them next to each other, it was kind of like this little kid next to this much larger character. Hey, what's with all this Save the Solar System stuff anyway? We knew that players were going to want to be able to play as Clank and use Clank. And so that's why we decided to create gameplay for us. We came up with the main characters, Ratchet and Clank, within two weeks. We had nothing at one point. Fortunately, the nearby planets will supply us with all we need to create our new home. And two weeks later, we had designs, we had a part of a level up. It was really rapid. Some, some companies spend a couple months, some people spend six months developing a character but everything just really fell into place. Maybe five weeks total from knowing absolutely nothing about what we are going to do to we had Ratchet actually moving around through a 10th level. It said a lot about how enthusiastic people were uh, when it came to the concept. <laughs> the first thing we want to do is make sure that the gameplay is viable and that the design is going to work. So um, all the designers know how to use Maya and they will build these very simple environments. So once we kind of got the level up on its feet in this boxy version, we'd say, okay, the gameplay works and now let's do the final. And that's right. where it gets handed over to the artists and the animators. Trying to get the levels to feel as though they were alive was actually a really big undertaking. Um, we were trying to not have it at any point really where you just stood there and the screen was dead. Our job is to do the character animation, any sort of sentient being, but here you'd see all the, uh, the ships flying around. Actually, those were all done programmatically. Once in a while, I found myself designing an entire level. Um, sometimes if someone had certain strengths in like doing grind rails or swimming challenges, um, sometimes designers would bring their concepts to us and you know, we would be in charge of shooting down all the really impossible ideas. I don't think he shot down any. They came up with some impossible ideas and like, let's have this, this section on a train and like you're gonna have boxes on top of the train you can jump on and that you can like, throw your yeah. minds out and they're gonna land on it but they're still gonna stay on the train and all this and you say like, they're yeah, real. Yeah, alright, I'll do that. Not quite in that high pitched up, but <laughs> like, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, there were a, a number of interesting ideas, like you know, creating a train that moves fluidly through the level that you can stand on, and that all the gadgets and the enemies can stand on, and all of physics works the way you would expect it to. Uh, which we eventually, you know, made a system for handling. And I think at one point in our space station level, the idea was to have, you know a derelict ship that represented about one third of the level and then, you know, to have it blow up halfway through. And so, you know, just kind of annihilate one third of the level, which um, I'm sure in somebody's head that seemed like a nice simple idea, but uh, in the end we did it and it worked and it's cool. So once we kind of had an idea of the route we were going to go, um, the designers would sit and have discussions on all the different gadgets, and we would just come up with around 50 or 60 gadgets. Did you see all the cool gadgets they're making? Let's go get some. We started out gadget heavy, and we came out with a, came up with a few that were pretty cool. Hey, cool! It's a uh, uh, what is it? But then I think once we started coming up with weapons. <laughs> And then the focus just shifted somewhere along the line to blowing stuff up. Build our weapons while you build your future. The toughest challenge for me was um, creating the strengths of a platformer and the strengths of a shooter. Pick any platformer out there and add weapons to it and the gameplay breaks just like that because, I mean, it's just but easy. Not having a player be able to go in with the blaster and just destroy all the enemies in the level, and that's the end of it. So creating that type of balance between those two different genres, I think, was most difficult for me. 
you know, in the beginning, I wasn't really sure if just the basic stuff was going to work, like just putting uh, different weapons in his hand and, and being able to switch them and stuff. You get two-handed weapons and one-handed weapons and different firing animations. And the firing animations have to play while you're walking and jumping and stuff like that. So you're, you're doing any one of your moves, like uh, you, know, you know, a long jump or a, a super high jump or a gliding, whatever. And then, you know, you fire your weapons at the same time. So that, all that stuff had to had to blend together. You know, it was it was kind of tricky at first, especially when you get like, something as big as a rhino, which is you know the same size as Ratchet, and he's holding this thing, and you don't want it to you know you don't want it jerking around as he changes animations and stuff. And, uh, you know, it took a while. It took some extra matrix filtering. But it's it's one of those things. You just <laughs> if no one notices it, you win. As you can see, everything is moving along as planned. We decided to make a very big game. Uh, Ratchet and Clank, as far as the geography goes, is about ten times the size of Spyro. And as far as gameplay variety goes, I'd say it's about ten times as complex and varied. Yeah, it, it became a, a real problem about halfway through when we realized how big the designers wanted the levels. And it, you know, they, they definitely weren't fitting. It's pretty much something that's happened to every single project. We lay out some restrictions. This is the size you get, and then uh, they'll pretty much double that by the fourth level of design. For someone doing the technology, you, uh, I guess you just live in a constant state of stress that is not going to work, and it'll be all your fault. So if at the end it ships and it works more or less, then you know, proof. If Al can't fix it, it's not broke, right, Al? Ah. That's a real testament to Al Hastings and uh, Gavin Dodd figuring out ways to make the levels load very fast. Those guys spent a lot of time making sure that the levels, these huge levels, loaded very quickly. And we were able to mask that with these flights through space. Our goal was to never have the word loading show up in the game. And that we brought over from Spyro. In Spyro, uh, on the, in the games that we made, uh, you never see a loading screen. Spyro is always flying between the different worlds. All of the infobots that you pick up in the game are little mini movies, and we realized that that was going to be the best way to convey information about the next place that you go. Hello, citizens of. This is Darla Gratz reporting. What live makes one man toil in obscurity while another becomes? Maybe, maybe. This is the has this ever happened to you? Even though we knew what the scripts were and we knew exactly what the story was, to see people laughing at the way the actors were coming off and the way the, the animation came out was really satisfying for those of us who participated in the story. We wanted it to be funny and just a silly premise. So the idea that someone is taking parts of planets and just putting them together in some big Frankenstein planet was just weird. Ultimately, it's my responsibility to make sure that the story and the macro work together, but I'm not the one writing the story. Um, we have our animation director and our lead technical uh, animator coming up with the actual scripts. What makes these characters tick? It, it, there was a lot of thought put into that. We wanted Ratchet to be a very heroic character, and he did, in the, some early writing, did seem a little too laid back kind of surfer dude, and then we immediately nixed that. We wanted him to be more heroic. But we also wanted him to be, even though he's not, a little more human than a lot of the game characters you see, where he does have problems. The easiest thing, once we made the decision, was Clank. He has no sense of humor, no idea that what he's saying is funny, and a lot of times that can be quite humorous. You sure showed him. I suppose I did. And then we heard uh, the actor do the voice, which was very deadpan and low key. He, he just came together very easily. Hey, you're that robot guy, right? No, actually, I build robots. I myself am not a robot guy, per se. <laughs> Nerd. I like him. We have some animators here who came from doing feature films, and they were used to doing about 200 frames a week. And they had, they're trying to do 200 frames a day. From my perspective, uh, I think the biggest challenge was making sure that the macro, the macro design worked with the story throughout the game. Because every item that you collect in Ratchet, every, every character that you talk to in the game, has something to do with the story. Ha! Real men can spin without silly toys like that! We were writing dialogue for the, the cutscenes 
up to like maybe two months or three months maybe before ship. Believe me, there's nothing worse than storing down a Blargy and Snaggle Beast from the inside. And we were working on those right up to the last minute. Well, I think the end of production this time as we were going gold was one of the most, more difficult periods at Insomniac for some people. I feel like if anyone had left during the um, last few months of production that the whole game would have suffered. My entire battalion went AWOL and left me to fight this war on my own. At the end of the project, we were doing a lot of testing. As you can see, we're about to test our newest automated pilot's helmet. Because the game is so complex and so big, uh, the testing seemed interminable. We still have a, a few minor adjustments to make. We have some really good testers, and they can just find all the problems. There was one day I think someone was, they could zap an enemy through a force field, and then basically it was in the Hollow Guys challenge. And you could just zap this guy right through the force field and kill him, and then the, and then the force field would disappear, and you could make your way all the way through the challenge. And that was just like the straw that broke the camel's back. We were just scrambling to fix a lot of problems that cropped up at the last minute. I'm not gonna last much longer! Request an immediate assistance! If you get too many bolts here, it, it breaks the, the first three levels because now it's too easy because you have the rocket launcher and, and et cetera. And so having the weapons not overlap too much and having them balance out with the whole economic system so they're at, at the right price and you get the right money at the right speed. And, and the weapons actually, each one is individually fun by itself and worth the money you pay for it, which, which is kind of a nightmare. Dispense with the pleasantries, Lieutenant. My sources tell me you're behind schedule. There's a lot of pressure on us to release the games on time because Sony has this huge marketing budget that's devoted to the game. And if we miss our deadline, then that's a lot of money out the window. You said it, pal! Probably my most terrifying memory was going into the meeting with the animators and telling them that they had to work uh, pretty much every weekend and every night for the next month or so when we got towards the end of the deadline. Of course, sacrifices must be made. <laughs> Thank you for your cooperation. I spent a few nights here. Uh, it felt like I spent several weeks here at the office. Um, there were people definitely pulling all-nighters, and that's something at Insomniac that we try to avoid at all costs because nothing will burn you out quick, more quickly than spending three nights in a row at the office. Sometimes we try to lodge Nerf balls up in the, uh, the girders. <laughs> I mean, your productivity just goes through the floor. And uh, we run around the office. I think we have some remote control cars and some Nerf guns. To actually go through all the things that we went through and, and keeping ideas and throwing out ideas and, and finding things that just really worked and doing a lot of testing, um, to actually see the game completely put together. Just seeing the cover with the two characters that I actually built those two models. It's uh, like, wow, that's, that's my work right there on the, on the store shelf. To see it being bundled in Japan uh, was even more incredible for us. Um, it was really uh, exhilarating. I, it's always a combination of relief, excitement, a um, little bit of trepidation because you're not sure how the consumers are going to respond. It's kind of nice to have designers which are constantly pushing the boundaries of what you would think is possible and coming back, you know, ultimately maybe even with a few things that turn out just to be flat out impossible because then you always know that you're right on the cutting edge. What's great is that there are a lot of people out there who are still pushing the envelope, trying to make stuff that truly is different and not just uh, going with yesterday's ideas. Sometimes it's really hard because it seems like every idea has been done. Um, but we really struggled to, to make the gameplay the core factor that drives the game. And I think when you have that, then everything else will shine. To see the kind of response on the web and see the kind of reviews that we were getting. Uh, and to have consumers just email us out of the blue saying, we love this game. Thank you for making this game. I mean, I think that makes everybody here feel really good about the long hours and uh, neglecting their kids and their wives uh, to, and, and husbands to, to be in this industry. That's, that's the reward. That should just about do it. Commander, we are finished with this world. Commence towing our planet to its next destination.